Queen Elizabeth is the longest reigning British monarch in history. But there are some here in Canada who would like to see her days numbered as our head of state. And not just hers, but her heirs and any other vestiges of the monarchy as well. It's a topic that crops up now and then, but after another member of the Commonwealth, Barbados, recently decided to ditch the monarchy, it's come up again here. With us for the pros and cons of that idea, all of them in the provincial capital, let's welcome. From the Entertainment District downtown, lawyer Delia Opekoku, who among her many accomplishments was the first Indigenous woman to be called to the Ontario Bar. In West King West, Hans Bethija, Vice President of the British Canadian Chamber of Trade and Commerce. In Bloor West Village, Peter Danolo, formerly the Director of Communications for Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. In Corso Italia, Ashok Charles, Executive Director of the advocacy group Republic Now. And in East York, former Sun Media columnist Christina Blizzard, who covered several royal tours in her long career, and when she speaks, you will get a hint of an accent that suggests she just may be from across the pond. Uh, great to have all five of you with us tonight on TVO. Let's set up our discussion, if we can, by having our director, Sheldon Osmond, bring up this little fact file just to set the table for the discussion to come. Queen Elizabeth II is currently the head of state in 16 countries, including, of course, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and several other countries in the Caribbean and Pacific Ocean, such as Jamaica and Papua New Guinea. The last country to remove her as head of state was Mauritius in 1992. Up until now, 16 countries have dropped her as head of state since she was crowned, and Barbados will do so by November 2021. At age 94, the Queen has been on the throne, imagine this, for 12 Canadian prime ministers, 12 American presidents, and seven popes, and she has been Canada's head of state for nearly half of this country's existence. Okay, let's get to this. Christina, since you've got the accent, I guess we'll start with you. Uh, what does the monarchy, in your view, provide Canadians? Well, I think a constitutional monarchy with a, a parliamentary democracy is a very stable form of government. The crown, uh, as representing the state, as embodied by the queen, is a very, um, I believe, has provided this country um, with uh, a very stable, as I said, um, overarching uh, sense of government that has provided continuity. The crown has a history of protecting minorities uh, in this country. And I think that as the queen um, embodies the state, if you look at a republic, for example, the, um, the president is the personification of the state, of the government in a republic. And if the, if the president is dysfunctional, then the government is dysfunctional because it is so uh, uh, such a personal thing. And, you know, we only have to look to that great republic to our south to see that... Uh, you know, when the president is dysfunctional, you do have uh, problems arising where you can't even guarantee the peaceful transference of power, as we're now seeing during this election. Okay, Peter Danolo, let me ask you the same question. What, in your view, does the monarchy provide to Canada? Well, listen, I think the monarchy is an anachronism. There was a case for it, certainly in our early years as a country, 150 years ago. But my basic problems with the monarchy are twofold. One is that it's a, I don't believe that high public office, any public office, but particularly the head of state, high public office, should be hereditary, should be passed from one generation to another within a single family. I think that's fundamentally undemocratic and at odds with a modern democracy. And secondly, to add insult to injury, uh, this is a British monarchy. It's a foreign institution. They're foreigners who are uh, our heads of state. I think Queen Elizabeth is a is a figure of tremendous. She's a very impressive person. She's kept this institution going much longer than it should have. I think we should we should adopt a, a practice from the NHL and the other major leagues. And when she goes, we should retire her jersey. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a nice analogy. Let me uh, let me ask the follow up question, which is your former boss, Jean Chrétien had a lovely friendship, relationship uh, with the Queen of England. Uh, how, how does he feel about your taking this position? He still does. He's, a, he's only the sixth member, only the sixth Canadian ever to be on the, uh, on the Order of Merit, which is the only order that the Queen personally chooses. He's only the third Canadian Prime Minister to be there. He's known her for about 60 years, or certainly 50 years. So uh, he's a monarchist. Uh, he and I disagree. Uh, he would also feel that this is... Um, uh, not a top-of-mind issue for most Canadians. And in that, he's right. But listen, 
That's always the case with issues like this. We're kind of like, uh, we don't want to deal with it because it's too much trouble. We're, we're like the millennial kid living in the parents' basement because it's easy. It's, it's, it's easier than moving out. Well, we were very slow in adopting a lot of the, the usual vestiges of independence. We Listen, we, it took us almost 100 years as a country before we adopted our own flag. So, But we slowly but surely, we've done these things. The monarchy is the last uh, item of unfinished business in this regard, and we should check it off the list. Delia, what's your view on what the monarchy provides to Canada? Uh, my view on what the uh, monarchy provides to Canada is with respect to Indigenous people in that uh, the original treaties were signed uh, with the uh, representatives of the uh, Crown uh, in, the, in earlier years in the right of Great Britain and later on in right of Canada and in Ontario in right of both Canada and, on, and Ontario. And for the reason, symbolically, it's very important uh, for many Indigenous people, especially the elders, to maintain that relationship with the Crown. However, uh, my perspective is that the duties that uh, uh, ensued from the treaties have been taken over by the uh, Crown and Right of Canada and, in, in, uh, and the Crown and Right of the different provinces. And so if there was a republic, uh, the duties uh, or the uh, informants required to ensure that the uh, treaties continue between uh, the original Great Britain pre-Confederation would continue in any case because the courts have ruled many times uh, that uh, the uh, duties are embedded in the crown and right of Canada and in the uh, uh, in the crown and right of uh, the provinces, and so uh, that would remain. But I certainly know how important the crown is for Indigenous people. I'm wearing my uh, treaty medal because at a time when the uh, treaties were. Uh, were signed. Uh, this is what the commissioners who were representing the Crown would give to the Indian chiefs. And this is a commemoration medal of the Treaty Number no. 10, which is my treaty in uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And I remember when it was given out to us in 2017, it was given out by the Treaty Commissioner of, uh, of Saskatchewan, who represents both Canada and the province in the capacity of the, as the Crowns. Uh, it was a very respectful. Uh, uh, commemoration, and I recall especially the elders lining up to receive it and being so proud that they have the commemoration medals from the original treaty that was signed. Delia, and just so let me jump in for a second. Can you hold that up higher, just sort of right by your face so that we can see it? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. And now, yeah. now it, it seems to me you're, you're rather proud of having been a recipient of that medal, and I wonder whether you're... you're you, you know, is your position consistent with with the honor that goes with that medal? Um, maybe slightly not, but I certainly respect the elders, and I'm trying to carry forth their uh, their position. But my position is that uh, the uh, responsibilities and duties uh, signed under the treaties, irrespective, would carry on. I understand. Okay. Ashok, let me put this to you. I, th I think everybody who comes to this country as an immigrant has to swear an allegiance to the Queen when they do so, and I guess you did. And then yes. 27 years later, I gather, you officially recanted that oath of allegiance, and you may have been the first Canadian ever to have done so. So tell mm -hmm. us why you did. So there were uh, two reasons, I would say. Uh, the first is that I simply do not have any allegiance or faithfulness to the members of that, the British royal family. I don't, and I wanted my government to know it. Secondly, I want to draw attention to how poorly this citizenship oath serves us. Um, I think we've got the whole thing backwards. We shouldn't be having Canadians swear fealty to the British royal family. We should be having our head of state um, pledge to uphold our charter of rights and serve the citizens of Canada. I think we've got that completely backwards. And, and secondly, I want to draw attention to the fact that this citizenship oath is our only opportunity to elicit a formal pledge from uh, new members of our society. And we squander that opportunity, insisting that they pledge fealty 
to the British royal family. We could be asking, as Australia now does, uh, Australia had an oath of citizenship similar to ours, and now they have a much, much better one, which uh, requires a formal commitment to democracy, to uh, egalitarianism, and so on. And that's what we should have. All right. Hans, you know the setup that's coming here. You're the guy who came to Ontario uh, back when Bill Davis was premier. You were telling me about how welcomed you felt uh, in the province of Ontario uh, when you first came here. What's your view on whether or not swearing that oath of allegiance to the royalty is important? Well, I mean, uh, you know, to, to be transparent, I mean, I came from the UK. I'm, I'm born in London, England, and came over here as a, with my family back in 75. My father is a refugee from the partition of India, so he moved from the Dominion of Pakistan to the Dominion of India, then ended up in London, England, my, my, my mother, who's from Straight Settlements UK, which is now Malaysia. And uh, we came here in 75 because, you know, certainly Pierre Trudeau uh, issued a call uh, to come to Canada. So, you know, Trudeau and Davis working together to make Ontario a wonderful place to reside in um, was amazing. Uh, I became, my family became um, Canadian citizens in 1985. Uh, you know, by that time, certainly the last vestiges of British uh, citizenship in terms of rights and privileges in Ontario, in terms of voting and so forth, had come to an end. Um, we proudly became Canadian citizens, and certainly I've availed myself of all opportunities within this great country called Canada um, you know, to, to play a part in the body politic and in civil society. So, but my take, given my father is from India, we certainly have a far more complicated relationship with the Crown than, say, Canada does. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm somewhat more neutral um, because of that. But that being said, if from a business and trade perspective, the Crown does afford stability uh, in terms of trade and commerce. It does allow us connections to other Commonwealth realms as well as the Commonwealth of Nations. So my take is it provides a stability that Canada needs in this war crazy world we live in. I mean, we look south of the border, what's going on with the Republic down there. We've got China, uh, which is not democratic, nor a monarchy, nor a Republic. Uh, it, is, it is its own, uh, well, it is a Republic in, in a sense, uh, but they have their own system. So our system, I think, has worked well for all 11 crowns, as well as the federal territories. And Delia makes a good point. Their hereditary chieftains they certainly feel very much a kinship towards the monarch. They do preserve the 70 or so treaties in terms of the older treaties. Uh, and the Canadian government has done, you know, uh, somewhat of a mediocre job, I'd say, managing those treaties. Uh, I'm not going to opine on that one. I don't have the, I think, capability nor the, the background to opine, but I would say mediocre, uh, you know, ability to manage those treaties. We are getting better, no doubt. Um, but each province, cap the provincial capitals and, and the Ottawa, have responsibility to manage those trees on behalf of the Crown. And I think we are certainly progressing. I mean, Peter says, you know, we are evolving. That is true. And I will make a plug and say in 1988, when the Canadian Heraldic Authority was formed, that really was the last vestiges of the UK that we had, because now we can issue our own honours and, and awards. So we are a fully sovereign and functioning country. Uh, the provinces and federal government do work together in terms of our confederation providing the stability for trade and for commerce and for citizens to evolve as they see fit. If Canada decides to go a republic route, it would need the majority of all the provinces okay, and well, the hold federal off on government that. to come hold, together. Hold off on that, Hans. We're going yep. to get to complicated constitutional amending formulas later in our discussion. I want to get Peter Donolo back in here because um, recollection is that back in the day when you were working for Jean Chrétien, you quote-unquote, accidentally put on some agenda the notion of getting rid of the monarchy. Uh, what happened there? Tell that story, if you would. Oh, yeah, listen, uh, as you know, as uh, I worked with Chris and with you through the years as uh, in terms of media relations, and I let slip once one of my preferences. I've been a, I've been a Republican for, you know, or an anti-monarchist, let's put it that way, because I uh, republics are different matters, since, uh, you know, uh, I was a kid, basically, and I let slip in a conversation with one of our most prominent journalists that, hey, this would be a good idea to put in a throne speech. And, of course, this ended up on the front page of the paper. Mr. Krejcian, being the uh, cool cucumber he is, didn't sweat it for uh, for a moment and laughed it off. I thought my neck was going to be on a line, but it wasn't. Uh, and then that was just a, one of the fun episodes I had uh, working for a guy who was just a lot of fun, the best boss I ever had, and still a great guy. But it doesn't change the fact that the monarchy, as I say, is an anachronism. I, I want to add one more one more problem with the monarchy, which is that not only 
foreign, not only hereditary, but our head of state has to be from one single religion, the Anglican Church. The, the British monarch is actually the head and protector of the Church of England. Again, so that in a country as, as diverse as Canada, that's a, another standing insult. So no, I think it's uh, it's time for the monarchy to go. How we do it is, of course, a, a fraught manner. And I want to point out just one other point, since you've given me the mic, Steve, which is that, and I like Chris a lot, but I think she does what a lot of monarchists do, which is present a false dichotomy. If we get rid of the monarchy, then we have to have a U.S.-style presidential system. That's not the case at all. Look at Israel, uh, Germany, Italy, they have heads of state who are chosen by their legislatures, not at all like the American system, and their head of state does not have the powers of a U.S. president. So I think that false dichotomy, I, I reject it, and I, I think it's it's uh, it's a rhetorical uh, um, uh, it's a record, rhetorical thing, but I, I really don't, I think it's a bit unfair. Okay, Christina, take them on. Well, okay, first of all, I think that to open up this can of worms would be very difficult, it would be very divisive, any time I've covered royal tours, you understand the depth of feeling. Canada is the, you know, you know, it's the land of the empire loyalists. This is where people came after the War of Independence. And there are very strong feelings through great swaths of Ontario. You only have to see, uh, just watch, uh, you know, people come out, stand 10 deep waiting to see the queen or whatever war royal is there. And when you interview them, uh, it, people have this very deep feeling that, that, uh, the crown is one of the things that define us, defines us within the North American context. They understand that Canada, while we are a very large country, we're a very small population. And this is the one thing that sets, oh, one of the many things that sets us apart from the United States. And they want to maintain that very much so. And the crown has, as we've seen, has uh, um, you know, changed and evolved over the years, and it renews itself quite regularly. And I think, I think to open up this debate is something that we don't want to do, especially not. Um, I think it would be very difficult with First Nations. Um, you, any, any, uh, any time you're on a royal tour, uh, at every stop there will be a First Nations leader, a chief, and they will come out and they will bring with them a framed copy of their treaty. And they will, it, it's not It's not to say, oh, look what we found in our archives, isn't this interesting? What they are doing is they are taking it to which, whichever royal is there and they are saying, here, this is the treaty. It was signed by your grandfather, your great-grandfather, whichever, whoever. And they're holding that, the royal, the, you know, the, the modern royal to account for that treaty. They're saying, this is our treaty. We want you to uphold this. Remember that your forebear signed this. So I think you would be, this would be opening up an unnecessary uh, can of worms that we really don't need to do because the crown has served us remarkably well. Delia, does she make a good point? Uh for, for many of the elders, yes, she makes a very good point. But the reality was that the treaties were broken in spite of the crown so often, especially in the times after 1812, uh, when uh, our strength as partners and allies we uh, started to weaken because of the takeover of the settler governments. Uh, but the representatives of the crown uh, that were on hand in Canada did not uphold the treaties. And the only time that the treaties have been upheld is very recently with the, uh, in fact, the only time that treaties were uh, were taken to court because we had no, uh, we didn't have the means to, uh, to uh, challenge anything against the uh, treaties because our right to hire a lawyer was uh, uh, taken away from us uh, until very recently. I think it was uh, in the Indian Act until 1950 that uh, Indians could not challenge uh, uh, the, the treaties or land claims uh, and hire a lawyer. Uh, and that was the officials who represented the Crown doing that. She's symbolic, yes, or the, her, her uh, ancestors are symbolic, and it's important for many Indigenous people that she carry on. But the reality is that the treaties did not start being protected and then until people uh, who became educated were able to challenge in court. And that only started happening in the 1960s, 70s, and on.
Okay, let uh, me put that argument to Christina Blizzard. And, and not only that, Christina, but you know there are critics today who say that the monarchy it reminds them of colonialism. It is an out-of-date institution. In fact, some would allege that it's, it's a racist institution as well. Could you speak to those criticisms? I think those criticisms are absolutely baseless. In fact, the Queen has demonstrated on numerous occasions that she is certainly not racist and, racist, and she opposes racism. If you look back to um, 1987, uh, there was a big movement within the Commonwealth to uh, a lot of the Commonwealth countries wanted South Africa dropped and they wanted sanctions. And obviously there was the issue of sanctions against South Africa because of that racist apartheid system there. And it's very well documented that that the Queen, behind the scenes, was supporting Brian Mulroney at the, uh, I think it was the Commonwealth Head of Governments meeting in uh, Vancouver at the time. And it was, uh, you know, she was pushing for uh, sanctions against her own Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, uh, did not want sanctions, and the Queen did. And she also wanted South Africa um you know, to remain part of the Commonwealth. If you look back to uh, when South Africa became a republic in 1960-61, the person who opposed that was Nelson Mandela. He wanted... Uh, uh, he supported the Queen. The Queen was gonna, lost all her uh, titles in South Africa, of course, when South Africa became a republic. And it was the white leaders in South Africa who wanted to become the republic. Nelson Mandela, uh, who ha became a lifelong friend of the Queen, when, when Mandela became president of South Africa, he invited the Queen back to South Africa for a state visit. And she, in turn, invited him back to the UK for a state visit. So I think that there's very flimsy uh, evidence. In fact, there's that very, um, that, you know, that very telling photograph of after South Africa did all this in the 1960-61, the Queen then made a point of dancing with the President Nkrumah of Ghana, uh, which, which was a photograph that shocked mm -hmm. uh, the South African leaders. The white South African leaders were angered and shocked that she was doing this. So I think to say that the queen is a colonialist or a racist, you're on very flimsy grounds indeed, because she has stood up to racists in uh, every turn. Well, let me bring another voice into this conversation, that of Philippe Lagasse, who is a monarchy scholar. And uh, we'll, we'll put this on the record and then consider whether those of you who would like to see this divorce happen uh, can make it happen, because it's complicated. Sheldon, here we go. When Canada patriated its constitution in 1982, monarchist premiers ensured that any change to Canada's status as a monarchy would require a unanimous constitutional amendment with the support of all provincial legislatures and the federal parliament. Specifically, paragraph 41A of the Constitution Act 1982 states that the unanimous amending procedure must be followed to alter matters related to, quote, the office of the Queen, the Governor General, and the Lieutenant Governor of a province. Peter, that sounds like an extremely high bar to jump over. Can you get over it? That's a problem. I mean, yeah, if it requires unanimous, cons unanimous consent constitutionally, very difficult to do, especially when most provincial governments and most Canadians don't consider it a priority. Uh, but listen, Back in 1965, I just want to pick up on something Chris said as well. Back in 1964 and 65, uh, many Canadians would have reacted exactly the way she described the United Empire loyalists reacting to the uh, abolition of the monarchy. And they did react that way when Lester Pearson proposed a Canadian flag. They derisively called it the Pearson pennant. Uh, it was said, listen, this isn't a priority. We have thousands of other priorities in this Canada. And he pushed and pushed hard and wasn't deterred. And I thought, I think that's a kind of political leadership that it would take for something like this in the monarchy. You know, the queen is not going to last forever. You don't have to be an actuary to understand that. She's been impressive. I, I agree with everything that Chris has said about her. But the fact is, she's not going to last forever. We should be preparing for what comes after. We don't. Do we really want a King Charles? Do we really want a King William? Do we really want to be uh, represented and led by a family that's better in the pages of Hello Magazine than they are in our halls of power? Ashok, you have seen the constitutional difficulty in jumping over that bar. What's your view on whether or not we could actually do that? 
Okay, well, one thing is that um, amending formula section that you referred to, it doesn't only refer to the office of the Queen. It also refers to the number of members in the House of Commons that each province is assigned, uh, the use of English and French as official languages, the composition of the Supreme Court. So to say that we can't change any of those things um, would be really pathetic, wouldn't it, to say that as, as a nation, we can't evolve in those areas. So let's take that, um, let's make that point first. Secondly, I want to draw your attention to the, um, the insight of a, a very qualified constitutional lawyer, Ted McWinney, who argued that, um, that we could begin the process of phasing out the monarchy after the demise of Queen Elizabeth II quietly and without fanfare by simply failing legally to proclaim any successor to the Queen in relation to Canada. So I'm not saying this is a slam dunk, this is the way we can go, but Ted McWinney was a very highly qualified constitutional lawyer. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer alive and he can't champion this argument himself, but the argument is there. And, and it's been made. And I think it certainly needs to be considered that we could sidestep the unanimity requirement. It is possible. It needs to be, that option needs to be um, studied. Hans, do you think it's doable? No, I don't, I don't think it's doable. I mean, we've certainly through Meech Lake, through Charlottetown had, I would say, much more simpler attempts to uh, reform our confederation and uh, certainly with limited success or in fact maybe no success at all uh, certainly Quebec I mean I went to Glendon College College Glendon and uh, we bear the scars of a bilingual education and I certainly wear my 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 school tie um, I went through the referendum back in the uh, early 90s there um, you know Quebec still has grievances around you know signing the constitution uh, Quebec is still angling for more powers. I think is, is after the last 24 hours, they've been angling for more powers in terms of the leader of the Liberal Party of Quebec. So to get to the point of a republic, you would need almost all 11 crowns to agree to that. It may be a shorter route. I mean, being, being of Indian heritage, I mean, India went to dominion status and then to republic status. Pakistan soon followed. It went dominion, then went to republic in 1956. So the question is for Canada is, is it a one-shop deal? Does it go to Republic right away? Very difficult to do. Australia, which has a very difficult amending formula, which is a, a double, double majority, majority in the states and majority at the federal level, uh, they couldn't do it. We have a far more complicated uh, formula in Canada in terms of also including the, our, our Indigenous peoples and our treaties. I mean, I visited all three chapel royals uh, here in Ontario, uh, you know, whether in First uh, Six Nations or... Uh, down at Massey, uh, St. Catherine's Chapel, or Tyananega. Uh, you can feel the loyalty towards the crown that the elders have. Delia points out it's the elders and the hereditary chieftains. And certainly our federal government has acknowledged that they are willing to negotiate with the hereditary chieftains. So to replace all that is a long road traveled. And is it a long road travel that we as Canadians, as taxpayers, want to take on at this point in our, in our, um, in our body politic? I don't think so, given what's going on again to the south. We're about to head into a very rocky time with the Americans, with Brexit going on, with my, my home country originally, uh, going through its troubles with Europe, and with the rise of China and other things. I think the monarchy provides a stability and oasis, and to get rid of it, to go to a Republican movement, is a really, really tough, tough road. I don't think Canadians have the appetite to do that. I mean, most Canadians are fairly dispassionate in politics in general, and this would certainly be a very passionate topic, but how passionate are people to replace all the symbolisms, all the traditions that this country has? And then the question will become, let's just say, for example, we do get to that point where people want to do this. Well, what symbols do we replace it with? In South Africa, they actually have a presidential monarchy where you know the president of South Africa looks after hereditary chieftains till this day. So this carries on. So there are many formulas we would have to get to to, to assess. I just don't see it happening, uh, Stephen. Well, let me see if I can uh, channel the, um, the compromising spirit of William Grenville Davis here and, and see if there's a sweet spot of compromise we can find here. On the one hand, there's the status quo, which is intolerable to some of you. On the other hand, uh, there is a, um, you know, 
republic-style democracy, uh, as in the United States, which is a complete non-starter to many Canadians as well. Uh, I wonder if there's not a, a compromise in, and Peter, let me get Peter and Christina to talk about this first, and just briefly, we've only got a few minutes to go here, with, with maintaining our parliamentary, constitutional parliamentary democracy, but having, let's say, the Prime Minister and the Premiers choose a Canadian to be the head of state. Could you live with that, Peter? Of course, that's what should happen, whether it's a a PM or the premiers or whether it's a name that the government puts forward to the vote in the House of Commons. It shouldn't be the way the current governor, the, the general governor general's currently chosen, because that tends to really just reflect the interest or whim of whoever happens to be prime minister. Uh, you know, other countries vote in parliament, maybe votes in provincial legislatures. Of course, that makes sense, Steve. The other thing is that, listen, the queen as a symbol or the monarchy as a symbol isn't what it was when uh, a couple of your guests first arrived in Canada. It's not what it was uh, uh, even 50 years ago. It's been diminishing every year, slowly, steadily, through my lifetime, used to be a time, and I, I'm too young to remember this, but in uh, in Ontario uh, movie theaters, people used to stand for God Save the Queen uh, before the movie started, uh, or at sporting events. Obviously, that's not the case. The Queen is not her, her picture's not even on all our currency. Let's continue down that path as well, of kind of eliminating the image of a monarch. As I say, no disrespect to Queen Elizabeth, but really, this is a family and an institution that belongs in the past not the present and certainly not the future. Christina, how about the compromise I just laid out? Well, I, I really disagree with Peter that people do not turn out for the royals. Now, clearly he hasn't covered the royal tours that I have covered because there you see hundreds of thousands of people show up every time the Queen visits uh, when uh, William and Kate came. It's it, This is not a dying institution in this country. And I think a great many people... Uh, are very happy with the way it is. I think They're celebrities, have, Chris. That's what they are. It's a it's celebrity worship. Well, they turn out for Kim not, Kardashian too. Yeah. No, that is that is where uh, that's when people royals want, run into trouble when they think they're the Kardashians. I think we've saw, we we have seen that with perhaps the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. That's their problem. That is not what you have seen with uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who see it more as a life of service, and that is what it has been. I think what will happen going forward is that once the queen is no longer the queen, I think Prince Charles will actually be a very good king. I think what he will do is modernize the uh, the monarchy. I think he will slim down the core uh, family just to its essence and uh, will make some reforms in that respect. And I think it will, as it always has done, as the monarchy has done over the years, uh, will evolve and change to fit uh to fit circumstances. But I think you really need to understand the depth of feeling for the monarchy. I was on one tour where the Queen drove from Stratford to Brantford, and they had to short, they had to, um, I was wondering why they were so delayed. It was because in every town, every village, hundreds of people had showed up. They've not just showed up, they had showed up in their Sunday best. So the Queen had slowed down the cars so they could all get a glimpse of her. Well, I think I will use three words which I could use pretty much at the end of every program, and they are, we shall see. I want to thank the five of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. We really appreciate your time. Take care, everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.